Good evening. I have been saying for some years, not many have listened, obviously, that our rapidly exploding population is the biggest single political and social issue this country faces. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? When more people come into the country every year than we even build houses, there's going to be a problem. When we don't build more roads, but the population rises, we're going to have a problem. When there are nearly 8 million people waiting for appointments with the National Health Service to have procedures. Again, an exploding population. We haven't got the GPs and the hospitals to catch up. And when Tony Blair came to power, the British population was 58 million people. It is now 68 million people, and 85% of that rise is directly down to immigration. So I've been banging this drum for years and years. But today, the Office of National Statistics have put out some predictions, some numbers, that I think might just wake everybody up. They tell us that the population will hit 70 million in the middle of 2026. That's against a previous estimate, just a few years ago, we wouldn't reach that number until 2035. They also say that between now and 2036, the British population will increase by another 6.6% million people and that 6.1 million of that is directly down to immigration. Now laughably, the Home Office this afternoon have put out a statement saying we're about to see a dramatic and drastic cut in net migration into Britain. But hey, these are the people that have overseen this just totally extraordinary growth. But there's another figure in these statistics that really jumps out at me and I bet no other news channel even talks about it, it's this. And I accept that it's a prediction, but remember, all of the previous predictions by the Office of National Statistics have proved to be underestimates. They say that between 2021 and 2036, they estimate 13.7 million people will move to the UK long term. And many of those that leave are people from established British families who've been here for generations, perhaps in some cases centuries, that are going off to retire or work or live in other parts of the world. It's the issue that no one wants to talk about, but it means an absolutely astounding cultural change in our country. Many millions of people who've already come and millions more that will come, with whom we have historically and culturally literally nothing in common and I believe the implications of that for our society are very very serious. I think many in Parliament and in government and in mainstream media know it and yet nobody actually dares to admit it. So let me ask you, do you agree? Is this the biggest issue that we face? I'd love to get your thoughts, farage at gbnews.com. Now I'm joined by Paul Morland, author and demographer. Paul, that figure I know they're estimates, but I made the point before, they've always been underestimates in the past, that 13.7 million people in the space of 15 years will settle long term in the UK. Coming, I mean, some of course will come with perfect English, some will come with shared histories, but many won't. It, it's huge, isn't it? Well, don't be surprised. I mean, the last data was that we were getting about a million in a year and about half a million out. And it's not all that different from what we've already seen. So it's not an astonishing prediction to say business as usual, roughly, may come down a bit, may go up a bit. But that's essentially what's happening. And the question really is, why is it happening? Why is it happening? And I think there are two drivers, essentially. It's true that we're not controlling our borders. It's true that we're struggling with that. But there's a bigger story, and the bigger story is that we have always, for hundreds of years, expected what I would call organic or natural population growth. That there are more births every year than deaths, yeah. and the population grows. And we have a population pyramid, which means there are plenty of workers to every retiree. That's changed. We've now had 50 years of sub-replacement fertility rate. That means a bit less than two per woman. It's now diving. So the, mid, the sort of mid-60s, end of the post-war yes, baby boom. Yes, the early 70s, we yeah. went sub two, roughly. And what that means is too few people are coming through to the workforce. And government is always under pressure from business 
to get more workers in. You and I remember when unemployment was the great problem, when we had floods of young people mm. entering the workforce. The reason that's not the case now, despite our sluggish growth, is that we simply have more people leaving the workforce than entering it. We have a huge requirement for people in the care sector and many other sectors. We haven't produced the people. And if we don't produce the people ourselves, those pressures to ship them in from elsewhere will just grow endlessly. I understand that. And of course, I also understand that the big corporates want labour to be as cheap as possible. Of course, yes. And that means minimum wage becomes the maximum wage in many, many industries. And you know, that's been going on for a long, long time. But, Paul Morland, there are 5.3 million people of working age not working. Not working. Ever increasing numbers being put on disability benefits. We also have a skills problem. I mean, areas like engineering, I know people that have got engineering factories, they literally have to import from abroad because there are lots of young kids with social sciences degrees, yeah. but not a, So there are things we can do ourselves, aren't there? Well, there are huge numbers of things we can do ourselves, which don't just include changing the birth rate, which takes 20 years to work through. One of them is indeed trying to get more people in the workforce, although I would say, if you look historically, our participating population is quite high. Back to the 50s and 60s, a lot of women didn't work. 70s, 80s, we had unemployed. So I'd love to see more people working. But actually, if you look at the share of the population that's working in the relative age group, it's quite high. Whether we can get it that much higher, I'm not sure. Okay. We can certainly reallocate people out of sectors that you and I might think are a bit of a waste. Yeah. An interesting discussion. I mean, we have a huge university sector churning out huge numbers of degrees of probably relatively little value and hugely require, re reliant on immigration. Mm. to fuel their numbers of students so that's an issue and I think that's very important but if you don't change the birth rate and we don't get more workers I get yes the, the wages will go up and that's very good for many people but we will have labor shortages in sectors where the state is expected to fulfill a promise so we aren't prepared to have elderly people sitting by themselves uncared for or operations not happening because people can't afford, because the labour price has gone And that's the pressure to bring workers exactly. in from abroad. Exactly. The point about births, I get completely, yes. as you say, it's going to take 20 years for that to yeah. change anything. There are things we can do. But, Paul, if we go on like this, with a million in and half a yes. million out, what kind of country is it going to be? Well, it's going to be a very different country, and not necessarily one that we would welcome. I think we are already a very multi-ethnic country, and there's a limit to how fragmented a country can be ethnically and still function. So I think the other thing we've got to do is focus the immigration on areas we really need it. And if you actually look at the numbers of people coming in, some are indeed coming in to fulfil those really important roles that we don't have enough people to do. But there are a lot of dependents coming in, a lot of <coughs> students coming in who never go. So I I think we should have a laser focus yeah. on what immigration we really need. I'm not need. sure that ethnically is the issue. I, I, I think it's more, you know, I don't think what colour people are makes much difference because we can all get on and five-year-old kids look at each other and don't even see those differences. I think, I think when it comes to certain religious differences and cultural differences and even linguistic differences, then the problem can be enormous. I think for a country to work, we do need to have a certain amount culturally in common. Yes. And when we are a fragmented group of people, when we're people coming from very different places, very recently, very large numbers, not assimilated, with no real requirement to assimilate, then we will be a fragmented society and we won't function well. Yeah, well, I think much of London is like that already. And yeah. London is the future. Neighbours of, of, don't even know each other's names. And, and that's the way yeah. the, country, the country as a whole yeah. will go. Horrifying. And I, I do think one thing I, I would like to stress is that we've never had a government that has talked about the birth rate. Macron in France, mm. he's not an extremist, he's a centrist. Mm. Only the other week he was saying, we need mm. to sort this out. Only a very few people on the fringe of British politics are daring to speak well, about this issue. Paul Morland, you dare to speak about it on GB News, and we thank you for coming in. Thank you for having and me. It makes sense to me. One of the areas, of course, that people are talking about a lot is housing. It isn't just that there are one a quarter million people on the social housing list. It's the sense of desperation for many who simply can't get on the housing ladder because demand exceeds supply in just the most extraordinary way. In fact, over the course of the last few years, you know, the Centre for Policy Studies estimates we have a deficit of 1.34 million homes. Now, if these figures are true, it would mean that we're going to need to build over the next 15 years 400,000 houses every single year. Is it possible? Can it 
be done. Well, I'm going to ask Chris Carr, the co-owner of Car and Car Builders in Grimsby, North Lincolnshire, but who's also president of the Federation of Master Builders. At the moment, Chris, and thank you for joining us, at the moment, I mean, we're lucky to build 200,000 houses a year, aren't we? Yeah, evening, Nigel. Yeah, we're struggling this year. I think we've struggled to get to 150,000. Wow. Uh, the ambition of 300,000 a year is, is going to be extremely difficult to hit. Uh, and 400,000, I think, is totally unrealistic at the moment. And yet, as the population continues to explode, and more and more people have to live with mum and dad or grandparents or, or sharing rooms or, or even, you know, generation rent, living like students until they're in their mid-40s. Um, this situation just gets worse and worse, doesn't it? It does. Um, we need to look at what we actually are building. Uh, you know, we, we build a lot of three and four bedroom detached houses, yes. but we're not we're building a lot of bungalows, so people can actually downsize out the three and four bed detached and go to a bungalow, releasing more of those type of properties we're not building any well, very few single bedroom properties which nowadays is you know a young couple a professional couple that's what they're looking for and there isn't the kind of the builders aren't building that type uh, it seems to be predominantly threes and fours with the sme builders the smaller builders you have got a better chance because we have to differentiate ourselves between the volume house builders we can't compete with you know simmons and barrett so we have to have something different which are bungalows and smaller units i mean <sighs> There's obviously political difficulty with building in farmland, countryside, with, you know, a small village has another 50 houses, but it doesn't have another GP, you know, traffic, school places, all of these issues. Isn't the answer we need in our cities to build up? I think in your cities, yeah, I mean, I live, in, I live in Grimsby, which is obviously a small town, um, quite a bit of deprivation there, we, we can't get anyone to live in the town centres. So we have to make sure that you know there's not one policy fits all. We've just got to be more sustainable the way we build, in the areas we build, how we build, engaging more with the community, which is something a lot of developers have lost the art of doing nowadays. Yeah. Um, but, but I think you know building in city centres is one thing, but not everybody lives in a city. Most of our population don't. We've got to look at some rural housing. We've got to look at back to you know our, our rural housing, affordable housing was always farmhouses or or tied cottages. Do we need to go to encourage now? You know, landowners to start building, you know, rental properties on their own land. This is what happened mm. for generations and generations. Mm. No, that's a very interesting thought. And Chris, you know, I know there are difficulties with planning. I know there are huge problems with environmental uh, planning in particular. Um, but presumably, and I speak to you as National President of the Federation of Master Builders, presumably British building companies are in for a boom over the next decade and more. I'm not so sure. I I'm really do struggle. I mean, in 2025, we've got to build um, a new type of home, future home standards, which is going to make the, the whole way of building and, and more expensive and more difficult. Uh, I don't think we're going to have this boom that everyone talks about, and that's the worrying bit. And to build the builders, one thing we don't like, which will surprise most people, we don't like the boom, we don't like high prices. High prices kills off a whole generation of new people coming into the market. Yeah. We would rather have sustainability and a, and a stable market because high prices, every time it goes up, I lose about five or ten years of the people that can afford to buy the homes. And that can't be right. Interesting. Chris Carr, thank you for that. Very, very interesting. And not exactly, I have to be honest, what I expected him to say. Very interesting. In a moment, we go to...